This is Timmy Fitz. You're listening to the Break It Down Show with Pete and John. Tune in. Love it. Download it. Live it. Donald Vandergriff is a retired major who served our country for 24 years in the Marines and then in the Army. He's an educator and lecturer who specializes in training and military leadership. He holds a bachelor's degree in education from the University of Tennessee and a master's in military history from American Military University. He talked with us about his book, The Path to Victory, America's Army and the Revolution in Human Affairs, and what it means to today's military. And he's our guest this week on the Break It Down Show. Could you give us a synopsis of the book? You know, you and Pete are going to get deep into subjects, and I'm going to try and chime in with the 50,000-foot view from the uneducated guy who really wants to vote right. And I got you. My angle on this is that I would like to know enough for me to understand what our military needs in terms of support from a voter and what we can do to strengthen our efforts and try and bring guys home in one piece more than we do and everything that we can do to support the military in the ballot? Well, that's a good, very good question. And John, this is the way I would describe it to you. We do a fairly, a really good job recruiting and bringing in fairly good people into the military, but we fit them into a very tight box, an antiquated box that's uh, shaped by personnel policies and management tools that are 100 years out of date. And then we have an addiction as well as an obsession with high-tech weapons and solutions to human dimension problems. And so as a voter, I would say, well, when I hear about the personnel cost too much, which they like to do, but the numbers are not really changing uh, the last 20 years, what's really gone up is like F-35, which is going to destroy the Air Force or the F-22, uh, which is way, way too costly. Uh you win wars with the human dimension, not with the technological dimension. Uh, but we have it, the addiction is totally opposite. And what makes the human dimension so difficult for most people is it's the intangibles. Uh, if you look at the, our television shows like History Channel or Military History Channel or 2020 or 60 Minutes, they entirely almost always focus on weapon systems because it's something we can grasp, we can touch, and we can feel. And uh, and it's what we've back, gotten good at. Well, I wouldn't even say good at. I mean, what we're demanding in Afghanistan, for example, is the return of the A-10. That's what the infantryman wants. And then we spend, for example, during the 99 Kosovo War, the uh, Serbians uh, left Kosovo in better shape than they, when they arrived, despite the fact that we spent billions of dollars on uh, high-tech weapons trying to find them and shoot them. The uh, Serbian army even ran a contest who could build the, the best fake decoy to, to trick a uh, smart weapon, and it was a Yugo with a with a uh, log in it with a microwave oven, which they were able to turn on, so it sent out the signal, and it caused, I think, a precision bomb, 500000 to hit it, and they spent, what, $200 on it. Come on. So, yeah, yeah. They fooled us look- with a microwave and a Yugo? Those guys won the contest on who could cheaply deceive the American Army, plus the fact we committed a, an entire battalion of Apaches down to uh, to Albania, and we wouldn't commit them out of fear of uh, losing them. So tell me, it gets so expensive you don't want to commit your uh, all the money you spend on your weapons. And, when, and then when, in fact, we still manage people by management techniques that were invented right after World War II and before World War II, and we won't get away from them because those who succeed in them like the system as it is, but it's a very cutthroat, very backstabbing system which undermines professionalism. And that's those are the things I write about, and I try to suggest ways to, to make it better. Yeah, and, and we appreciate that work. That's stuff that needs to be done. You're right. We have to modernize how we handle promotions, for example. Yeah, the upper out system is a very cutthroat, very stab-in-the-back system, which is only works when it's supported by a uh, bloated officer system at the top. Can you give uh, and, us an up and, up and out system explanation in a couple short sentences for the dumbasses like me out here? Sure. What happens is you go up for promotion, say, three times, and if you don't make it a third time, you don't get promoted and you have to get out. That's it uh, for you, yeah. three times. 
Three strikes. Well, it, it's been modified in order to fulfill. It's been modified where a major can stay longer than 20. That was one of them. But what happens is if you get one strike in an officer evaluation report or a less than perfect remark in an officer evaluation report, you're not going to make it. And that's what's really sad is that we don't have the moral courage to face our people and tell them when they're not good or great. But people all believe in surveys taken at command and staff and the war college are all 80 percent or above. People think they've done really well, even though a subtle clause or a subtle remark in a officer evaluation report will do you in. So it, and what it really makes is in a system where you have to have trust, trust means everything in an effective army or military. Sure. And the upper out system is the type of system that undermines trust. Wow. John, just before we got on the air, I was talking to him about how they put captains into a meat grinder. And uh, part of the up and out is you're going to work hours and hours and hours on mundane things. And, and that really lasts deep into your, your career as a major. And those that come out on the other side, they get promoted. Those that piss someone off, make major, maybe colonel, then they get out. And those that don't want to do that for the next 10 years of their life, get the hell out of the army. No matter how good a person that or a good officer that person is, they're just like, I don't want to make PowerPoint slides for the next 20 years. Yeah. Exactly. And, and what's sad is this whole thing came about in World War One, and I have a whole entire chapter in my new book about it after 10 years of research. But we copied the French staff system, which we had no other models because we, we had only gone to war in case of emergency. And uh, we created a staff system that was modeled off their French. And we kept growing it because we believed that more officers would be better because we could somehow find the better officers that way when we had no idea that there was an intangible system of professionalism that the Germans had, which was a lot smaller and a lot lower in number. Added to that, we went into war one basically in the fourth quarter of the ball game, but we felt because we were successful against the Germans, their system couldn't offer us anything. So we continued to copy the, the uh, French and British after World War One, which focused on the Cartesian mathematical system as well as the bureaucracy, bureaucratic system, and we continue to bloat our officer system, which it, which by the time World War II came around was very risk-averse. And when we went to World War II, fortunately the Germans made incredible strategic errors, so did the Japanese, but it didn't neglect the fact that in 1944 they were the Germans were still effectively fighting despite strategic errors. Uh, so, so Don, we're going way back in history. We're, yeah, you know, a yeah. hundred years ago now. Let me just ask you this: We had uh, Doctor John Noggle, retired colonel, now headmaster, the guy that wrote the book uh, for the military yeah. on coin. And man, what a firestorm lit out from that! He got colonels going crazy and and angry where they just can't even yeah. stand like you know we're always kind to our guests and so we give yeah. we give john the proper courtesy and, and talk sure. in terms of his accomplishments because they are substantial but man you can't you can find some people that get angry at john why is that well john sold a bill of goods one his interpretation of malaysia was not fully portrayed in his book uh, eating soup with a knife and then some other historical things were grossed over in Malaysia, which by the time the part that he described in his book took place, the British had the total ability to fence off the population and put them in uh, sealed camps. And the enemy was very small compared to what we fought in other places. In addition to that, coin only works if you have a government that's very popular and uh, the people want to do the fighting for you. And the, the Americans don't come in and build bases everywhere with Burger King and McDonald's and so forth. Uh, and they mix, they really mix with the population. Well, that, that's coin, a great point. Go ahead. I'm talking about coin, you have to have a legitimate government that's recognized right. and someone trying right. to, to undermine it. That really right. is what an insurgency is. And when you try to counter the insurgency, there has to be a government that's believed in it. And that simply wasn't the case in Iraq or Afghanistan. But I don't know that that's John Noggle's problem. No, that's, not, you know? that's not his fault. But right. what him and General Petraeus and them thought they could do is they could sell a, a bill of goods to the American public and to 
and, and to everybody else that they could go in and fight this bloodless war without uh, massive firepower and maneuver and all that stuff. But it has to start again with the resident government and how you train your, your people, how you train the advisors and, and how they go in there. And unless you're fully committed to what the special forces is supposed to do, you can't do coin. I mean, the special forces have been uh, turned into an immediate action, close contact, basically ranger style, style seal mission. And we've lost our strategic viability, which the special forces are strategically capable of going in and training people to do the fighting for us. That's what they're supposed to do. Jim Gant got it right when he went in there in Afghanistan. He wrote uh, One Tribe at a Time. He got it right, but no one supported him at all because our our army and our culture is not developed to do those kind of things. It's, it's centralized, linear firepower uh, to fight second generation or, or attrition warfare, World War II, World War I type, ba- type battles. You're talking in some pretty uh, high level terms for for a lay audience, and so yeah. let's just real quick. Sure. There are multi generations of, of warfare that are out there being fought. There's first generation, second, third, fourth, and uh, if you want to learn more about that, there's a lot of sources to learn more about multi generational uh, warfare. We're talking about a fourth and possibly even a fifth generation of warfare. Where you're right, nobody's going to fight us in a symmetrical battle. There's there's not going to be a tank. When was the last effective Tank on tank battle where our victory was in doubt. How many decades ago was that? Well, we even did the first Gulf War, the 1991 campaign, incorrectly, as I detail in an entire chapter in Path to Victory, because we fought the graphics and we fought a risk aversion versus the enemy. So most of the Republican Guard got away to fight another day and put down two rebellions six weeks later. But was there uh, ever a doubt on their tanks being able to defeat our tanks? No, because uh, their tanks were uh, defective ammunition and so forth, and, and we had the mass necessary. And there, and frankly, Pete, uh, we were fighting an army that was as bad as the Italian army in 1940 when that Wavell took them out in the Libyan campaign. So we were fighting an enemy that was absolutely had the worst command and control, had worse, com- tighter command and control than we do. Uh, so it was inevitable that we're going to win a tactical victory, but at the operational and strategic victory, uh, we did not win it. Basically, I think it's fair to say the U.S. military's tank-on-tank fight, there's not been anything where our victory has been in doubt in my lifetime, and I'm, I'm almost 45 years old. Is that fair to yeah, say? Ta- yeah, tactically, yeah, you're right. Uh, but tactics don't, tactical victories don't win fights, as we've seen in the last 12 years in, in these two campaigns, Pete, and by the way, I refuse to call them wars because they're not. They're small campaigns against an insurgent that doesn't have the ability to fight us toe-to-toe. They're not wars. The global war on terror is not even a strategy uh, because it makes more enemies than you faster than you can kill them. So, yeah, we can win all the tactical back battles you want. And the M1A1, A2 is an incredible technological uh, vehicle. But t- tanks' main purpose is not to win tactical battles against other tanks. It's to get in the rear of the enemy and destroy his rear and his, his ability and will to fight. Right. So so as a guy who, who's been a tanker, John Noggle also a tanker, why the hell do we focus so much attention on training? I mean, tankers go to NTC on pre-deployment training to be prepared to fight in Afghanistan or Iraq. And they're not going to drive a tank and shoot things. They're just not going to happen. And, no time in the, in the recent past has any tank gone anywhere in Afghanistan that I'm aware of and done anything. Yet when those units go to NTC, they focus primarily on tank-on-tank fights. Because you have an entire structure called TRADOC, Pete, that is built by General Depew in 73 to 76 by good intentions, very good intentions, the right intentions that have outlived their purpose. TRADOC is a big bureaucracy focused on linear training, and linear training is not adaptability development. Linear training is, spells out checklists, spells out how to do everything, how to measure it. And that's what we're built to do. And you can't do away with that unless you, as General Schumacher said about HRC in 2003, unless you tear the entire thing down and start over. And they're not willing to do it. Too many people are employed and too many retired generals and uh, colonels get great jobs at TRADOC after, uh, and sergeant majors after they get out. So trade-off, until you totally tear it down and reform it to be a true learning 
organization, which is not, you're going to continue to do what you just talked about. And by the way, Pete, look up at 2005 and 2006. 2006, the Canadians deployed an armor battle group to Afghanistan, which did very well. It did incredibly well. The Taliban was very frustrated. Morale was very bad because they tried to defeat this thing in so many different ways, and they killed a lot of Taliban and did very well. Yeah, that tactical fight, again, like we talked about before, that, that's that's controllable. We're good at that. We can put yeah. a tank on the ground and, and do things with it. But six weeks later, when that tank is not useful anymore because the enemy has left or has been defeated, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's no enemy commander that's going to surrender his sword and stack arms and walk away from the fight. The Taliban can say legitimately, we just beat the Americans. They, their combat forces are gone. Wow. We won. And there's not, there's no Taliban commander. You know, Mullah Omar is not going to say, here's my sword. Here's the, here's the, <laughs> the prophet's robe. We are sorry. We capitulate. Let's start anew. That's never going to happen. But tank on tank fight, long guns, artillery men who are out there trying to fight are looking for that guy with the sword to surrender. And I think you and I would agree, that guy doesn't exist. It's never going to happen. It's an ideological right. fight, and we aren't fighting with ideological weapons. But let me You're say something right. about what America Thank does y'all. right. We have the best schools of business. We have the best schools of management. We have the best – people come here from everywhere else in the world to learn business and management. They come here They come here to learn military things as well, all over the place. Let me put the military things aside for one uh, minute because it sounds like the military things are – you know, we're, we're outdated. We're w- focusing on the development of weapons that do great things for weapons, but we're not able to win wars, like Don pointed out. Why aren't we learning business and management from our own institutions? Why aren't we going in and saying, look, this is not how we run people. We know how to run people. We know how to motivate. We know how to deploy a force of people to get things done. We know how to create industry. We know how to do all kinds of things to motivate people to do their best work. And yet we have a system in the military that seems like it's broken. It seems like it's scaring away talent. It's taking guys who are good at what they do. And like you said, up or out, how do we fix that? Well, I've got an entire book that I rewrote last summer called Path to Victory, America's Army and the Revolution in Human Affairs, which, by the way, the Secretary of the Army, uh, Secretary White, the one that got fired by Rumsfeld, said at a news a reporter roundtable in August of 2002 that he held the book up in front of a bunch of reporters. I know because they called me on it. Five of them did and said this is the blueprint for the future army. What has to happen is we have to have the moral courage to say, hey, changing the personnel system is not an indictment of how you got there. The the intentions were good when it came about, but these intentions and assumptions are 50 and 100 years out of date, and we need to start over because we keep crying and keep using bumper stickers that we want to be a flat organization and a learning organization that practices a concept called mission command but we're not designed or nor our culture is developed to, to practice it. So we have to completely get rid of up or out. We have to assess. I'll, I'll do a quick summary for you, John. We have to do tougher sessions at the beginning of an officer's session. We have to change our education system to be more progressive based on the theories of Dr. Robert Bork out at UCLA, who's the leading learning guy in the, in the world and told the Army in 2006 – when General Wallace took over as trade up commander, that the way you train and educate is backwards. Uh, and, and I've written extensively about it, how to do it. And the irony is there's a lot of Army schools, including Cadet Command and, and West Point, that make my book mandatory reading for the cadre, but they won't even give me a shot at any job important enough to do anything about it. It's funny, they like to say they're using this stuff, but they water it down. Uh, but this is not about me. It's about making the military better and all i ask the army do the senior leadership and and the marines is it's not an indictment of you like i said earlier but successful organism organisms in biology evolve okay they evolve or they die and we need to evolve out of our antiquated linear industrial age ways and we're not doing that I appreciate the way that you say that, Don, and I know that you're the kind of guy who wants not to make it about you, but you do serve as 
really clear indicator of why the system is broken because when you have a resource, when you have a thought leader who's able to encapsulate some practice that needs to evolve, uh, seems like you get somebody who is afraid of their job going away to say, no, we don't need that. We don't need that. And it's funny to me that you are talking about how we mirrored the French personnel system instead of the German personnel system. And, and that's a great lesson in history. But it's one that is so old that I can't even think of why. It seems like when you bring that particular situation up, really does indicate how old the system that we have in place is. Right. Yeah, it's, a, it's not a series of how old it is, it's how relevant the ideals and the practices are. I'll give you an example. What the Germans did with their cadets was remarkable in the sense that they gave people, young people that were 17 years old and 18 years old after uh, maybe a couple of years of, of, of very progressive learning approaches in military art, and they gave them the exam where they had to write a regimental and division order and use only a page or less. Okay, why can't we do things like that so we learn how to write correctly and be concise as possible in our directions to our subordinates so we let our subordinates figure out how the how-to while we focus on the end state, the desired uh, result we want. I we love that study that. and concentration and brevity. Yeah. Oh, exactly. You're exactly right. Both of you guys are. You, you get it. But you, we don't even do that. We, you know, we, we spend... We spend incredible lessons on the military decision-making process, which was a misinterpretation of the French interpretation, a misinterpretation of how the Germans taught decision-making. And it, it resulted in the five-paragraph order, which I've seen some orders, 100 pages or more, just to go go into a tank range. Yeah, and they don't need to do that. A great compare and contrast with that is is as we were training the Iraqi army, uh, they were going to move a division headquarters, basically a division or brigade. Either way, a brigade is about 5,000 people for a commander. So you're talking about 10,000 people going from A to B and B to A. And that's pretty much how the Iraqis said it. Hey, the commander's going to gather his stuff and his gear and his guys and his trucks, and uh, he's going to drive it 10 miles that way. And then the other guy's going to do the same thing. He's going to drive 10 miles this way. And it drove the U.S. military crazy. They're like, no, you have to cover for all the contingencies. And they're like, no, we're just, we're just, we're just going to do it. And, and they did. They did. They just swapped places. And, and that's, that's as simple as it has to be sometimes. Well, when we, re when we recognize that that's as simple as it has to be sometimes, I mean, you, you got a lot of complexities to deal with some, in some cases, sure. But is the base problem that the leadership now is, man, I hate to, to word this this way, but are we waiting for our military leaders to die off so we can dust them to the side and get going it's, on? It's, John, it's not going to happen because the, they pick people in their own images on the centralized boards, which, by the way, organizations other than myself have said those are antiquated and they prevent the military from fully being adaptive. Wow. We have centralized boards where... Colonels and generals sit on these boards and they pick people that were developed like themselves and they, and they look for any one little flaw to not promote a person. Whereas, for example, the German system and their promotion boards, they disregarded a perfect record because that meant that person might not have moral courage to speak out. Another thing that's interesting is every, every modern, you talked about modern corporations and so forth. The most successful corporations and military organizations were decentralized in that they placed the trust in their people at the premium. We do everything as a centralized selection system and promotion system. The com they say the commanders have input, but they really don't because if they don't give their people a fully inflated glaring report, then anything less than that kills them on one of those centralized promotion boards. And that's a result because we maintain a very bloated Officer system. Fifteen percent of our army, for example, are officers, including warrant officers. Uh, that's another discussion point. But we have way too many officers, particularly at the top level, which drive decisions further and further to the top. Simple decisions, like we talked about just a minute ago, are driven even further to the top. So you don't develop your your junior people to be adaptive and take initiative because anything they do is going to be questioned. And 
changed or they're going to second guess on everything they do. So that's a result of, again, maintaining this bloated officer system for mobilization that we don't need because we need to switch to a truly expeditionary type system that goes in, does its mission, and then gets out and don't occupy anybody. Like I was even, uh, I was written in print where I was against us staying beyond December 2001 in Afghanistan. We needed to get out. We did what we needed to do. I supported that. And then uh, get out and hand the the ballot over to or the rucksack over to the people that were there that were friendly and let them deal with their own country. Boy, that makes uh, George Bush the elder seem a whole lot smarter. Go in, liberate Kuwait, and then leave. It makes we want to do something else. We want to take down Saddam, and we had to deal with Saddam for the next. Well, we're still dealing with the aftermath of that, but that is definitely an alternate way to cover that, and it's. But, and you know the Afghanistan fight, and what a lot of folks don't realize is how challenging it is to move weapons and material around. I mean, we were, I was at a camp where we were constantly provisioned by airdrop. And, yeah. uh, because there was no water, there was no food, and it had to be dropped in from the sky. And if you brought a vehicle out, it was a good chance that vehicle would be broken because there aren't a whole lot of roads. Getting in and getting out of Afghanistan is a way to do it. Of course, you also don't control your end state like we like to do in the military, you're going to get what you get. And we pulled out of Iraq, and, and look where we are now. We've got a problem we've got to go back and deal with. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. But again, what with a, an effective strategy that outlines why you're doing what you're doing, you want to counterattack. You know, William S. Lynn, Bill Lynn, wrote an incredible paper called Defense Offense Strategy that was published in American Conservative in 2004, and what it basically says is we worry about the centers of order in the world, and if we're attacked, we do a massive counterattack without occupying the nation after we counterattack. Belief that you can go into these cultures and put them in the American American way, you know, make them look like Connecticut or the Switzerland, is it a dream? It's a fantasy, but that's what a lot of people want to believe about about American exceptionalism that. We can go in there and, and change all these people want to be like us. That's not true. You know, unless we're going to, we're willing to bankrupt us like we have already. We've got to have a strategy. And the best, best thing possible is if you attack us, we're going to counterattack you so violently that uh, you're going to, you're, you're going to think about never doing that again. We leave a calling card and we leave. Occupations of countries, especially Christian armies in Muslim countries don't work. They're not going to work. We're pausing for effect because we are with you 100% there. I'm from Guam, and we love being American. We love being American. And we still look around and go, what are all these Marines doing here? And we love it. So imagine what the people who don't like us feel. I mean, I, I absolutely believe that uh, your your point is is a hundred percent valid. There's sure there, you know, a point can be made for us being there and us providing guidance, but that guidance has to be desired. And that guidance has to have a clear outcome and a goal that is attainable so that everybody can say, all right, this is great. We're glad you're here. And once you get us to this point where we've figured out all of these things to make our infrastructure happen, make it so that we can lead our lives, then you guys will go away. And if we can get to that, well, that's great. And I think that there are plenty of business models out there, and we happen to be close to Silicon Valley. So, you know, the tech sector for us, we're going, well, the tech sector solves a lot of problems. What are we doing with all these old problems? Why can't we solve them like a company would solve its problems? And Or, or a very successful uh, military organization that, you know, if I ask one of my audiences, which I lecture, to, uh, I talk a lot, and I always ask the audience a lot of questions. I said, what do you define as a learning organization or a flat organization? And I get 20 different answers. What does people really know what these things are? And these are uniform audiences I talk to. And I say a flat organization or a learning organization is a culture of empowerment. And they really think about that. The definition thing is huge. If you like the show, and you know you do, send us some pictures and movies. Don't do that. Support the show. 
There are three ways you can support us. Number one, go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. And leave a five-star rating in with you. It helps with the show metrics and helps us get better placement. Number two, visit our website, www.breakitdownshow.com. We've got an Amazon and an eBay link. Same Amazon, same eBay, you know and love, but they give us a little kickback when you get to their site from ours. And number three, leave comments about the shows that you like. We want to know what you think, how you feel. Tell us how to make the show better. We greatly appreciate it. Now back to the show. We like boobies. In the military, we talk about culture, and we understand that if we're going to be an occupying force, even if it's a benign or a benevolent occupying force, we have to deal with culture because you're you're colliding cultures together, and we're the cause of that collision. We're terrible at blending in culture, ours versus theirs and theirs to ours. We're just we're terrible at it. I guess what I'm saying is is if you're going to stay in an area as a military, as a State Department, we've got to get significantly better there. Have you done any writing on on blending culture from a them to us and us to them kind of level? Not 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 the societal that you're talking about, one society to another, but what you say is very significant. I'm sure there's a lot of people that have out there, but uh, my my deals with organizational cultures and cultures of subcultures of armies and so forth. What made them effective or ineffective? And I'm sure it would relate to larger societal cultural issues. When you want to go to Afghanistan and you want to try to improve the lot of the people there, Pete would say the center of gravity is the center, central population. A military commander has to be prepared to win on at least four different, maybe even five different fronts that I can think of. Obviously, one you have to win is militarily. You have to make the, the enemy at least run away, if not capitulate completely. But you have to be able to win socially, culturally, politically, and really, in most of the world, religiously. And if you aren't prepared to talk detailed training level tasks and in the in the military and the army we would call that a medal a mission essential task list and those right. tasks are broken down and I'm I know you know this stuff Dom this is more for the audience oh that's cool I got you those tasks are broken down to the very basic level so that it, it's as simple as the lowest level guy is going to carry water and and to successfully train for that mission they must be able to carry five gallons of water 50 miles or whatever that specific task is and you train to a standard you know, and I both, we both know there is nothing that there's no army officer or military officer that can speak intelligently about winning socially, culturally, politically, religiously. There's, there's, they don't exist because the training doesn't exist. So if we're going to go, it's one thing to say, let's not occupy, but the reality is this. We're trying to build a nation building force. And you said earlier, we don't train for it. We don't train for it. We don't train with the same detail that we do when we shoot artillery that incapacitates our commanders. And forces them to fight a losing battle over and over and over again, which again goes back to John's point, talking about how we're going to lose the best people because guys like Duke from the Seals, who was on our Johnny Walker episode, yeah. says the battle pace, we can't sustain. This is a Seal saying we can't sustain what you guys are asking of us. Our leaders, our political leaders, our policymakers don't understand what it takes to lift that bucket of water and carry it five miles. They have got no idea. How do we address a, that? You know, Pete, that's a great, it goes back to the careerism though. And let me, let, let, let me make a, let me go back a little bit. I'm not attacking the people in the army themselves. There's a, there's a lot of great people that have deployed numerous times over and over and they, they do the best they can. What teased me off is why we as the American people have allowed that. Why we, the most, I don't know if you saw Jim Fallow's article that just came out about the military, but we basically in our so-called love for the military, we neglect it and we were allowed to go fight these long extended campaigns that bring, that do nothing for this country except bankrupt us. So my point is, in a this is something I've always said. An effective strategy puts your army in a place where it can win. That's what an effective strategy is. It puts your military based on its cultural norms and parameters and strengths and weaknesses in a place where you can win. The strategy for Iraq or Afghanistan did not do that. So 
you say the commander in chief and Congress are responsible for that, but who advises them? Who says, sir, we cannot do that? You didn't see any resignations in protest over it, any retirement saying, we cannot do this. I got to retire in protest. You didn't see all the things that are covered in HR, HR McMaster's book, Dereliction of Duty about the defeat in Vietnam where the chairmans of the Joint Chiefs of Staff did not have the moral courage to tell the president, hey, we're fighting this war wrong. We're going to resign over this. And when General Johnson was about to go over to the White House and pull off his rank, he just, he said he had a failure in moral courage when he didn't do that. We, we have to have the moral courage to give the right advice. And we're wearing out our forces because we're so divorced with this volunteer military from a public that has to sacrifice anything. When the public has to sacrifice and when Congress is left with the decision making authority on war, like the Constitution says, then we will, we will not get into these quagmires. Okay. Now going back to what you said about calling that water. We're having guys having to go back and haul that water over and over again with no significant result or significant gain. That's frustrating to these guys. I talk to them every day. I've served with them in the last two years when I was in Afghanistan. I've been one. Talk- <laughs> yeah. I, 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 you I've were been, one like me. Yeah. You, but my point is it's the leader's job to give. The- now, yeah, eventually you have to salute and say, that's, you know, I'm going to execute this. But I have not seen one general officer resign in protest since 9-11 over this flawed, incredibly flawed strategy called War on Terror. And then it's supported by the fallen president, President Obama. I have not seen anybody because they think if they admit that, it's going to mean defeat. And in some minds, it's going to cost them post-retirement jobs of several hundred thousand dollars. When these guys make, you know what they make for... A three and four star make for their retirement pension? Please tell us. Oh, it's a lot. $214,000 a year. I, I went to a training exercise that was. That'll do. Yeah, it'll do. I went to a training exercise that was gigantically expensive that trained us essentially to nothing that we were going to do. So let's, let's yeah. just, let's just call it, let's just be nice and call it 50% effective. And they had hired a three star and he sat and he listened to briefs. Yeah. And that's great because a three star can provide you fantastic insight on, on what you're getting wrong or right. They've sat in more meetings than anybody you're ever going to meet. And uh, the three star listened to our briefing and said, real good brief. Thank you. And that guy got paid probably about 10 G's for that. Oh, sure. You and know. I went, I- I was watching war games at the war college a few years ago and they had all these school and advanced military studies. John, that's sort of like our second year command and staff college for the real advanced guy. And it's a fairly good course. They were sitting there being the toggle guys and the red cell was all manned by retired colonels and generals. I'm like, there's a great opportunity to take these young majors that are questing knowledge and put them in charge of the red cell. Let them fight the generals and, and stuff in the war game. Why do we keep bringing in what the so-called gray beards to do stuff that that's the problem where it is? They, you know, why they get a credible pension? Why don't they just go retire and go to a ranch somewhere and then move aside and let the next generation evolve? It's not, it's not bad for them if they get asked to come back and talk as, as a hero or give advice, but we have this incredible revolving door system in the beltway, which is, is very corrupt. We don't call it that. And, and, and people, John, the, the civilian side, don't realize the, how it undermines our system. I mean, we're giving these guys incredible pensions for their years of service. Why don't they take that pension and go somewhere and do something like teach high school, be, give something back to the community, and get out of the beltway and let younger, more maverick guys come up and take these positions and run things uh, without their interference. Well, let me turn that question on its, on its ear just a bit because sure. I'm with you in, in terms of, you know, if, if that's what evolution needs is for barriers to step aside, then great. Now, how do we create incentive for that to be the case? Or how do we set up a system so that we reward evolution and re- we reward 
progress in thought and in strategy and attract the talent. And I know that attracting the talent is not the key issue because the army, the military in general, you know, will get bright folks whose intentions are absolutely pristine. But how do we reward those folks and develop them and make it so that the system makes room for their evolution and for... Well, you get, like I said earlier, and this is funny you say that because in 2011, I got the the honor to work with some great officers on the Secretary of the Army's Human Dimension Task Force, and we answered all those questions, we provided answers to the questions. And basically, we said, you make transparent, you flatten the organization, you get rid of yearly cohorts. We manage by yearly cohorts. You, If you're going to decentralize the system and make it based on mission command, you put it on the shoulders of the individual, you make everything transparent. So with our technology like Skype, he sits there and says, I want to compete for this job. I'm ready for it. I might be a captain with only four years in, but I'm ready for that job. And he competes for it. I have gotten so many of my former cadets from Georgetown University and, and throughout the country that contact me now that said, I've met some incredibly bright people. Why did you get out? Because I was ready to contribute more to the Army or the Marines, and I couldn't because I had to do all these widgets, and I had to work for people that were not as intelligent as I were. But and then they we're going to keep you polishing widgets. Yeah, and, and we're going to make you do PowerPoint. I mean, people that were fluent in languages and new strategy, and they couldn't go anywhere because the system says that this year you're going to do this, and that this year, for example, our company command time, one of the most critical, we say small units are so critical, but the average company command time, and I might be off a little bit, is maybe 12 to 15 months at the most. And that's an incredible, if it's even 12 months. And then we move that captain out and put another new captain in there with maybe four years in the Army. The NCOs that run the company, their heads are revolving around the lady in the exorcist, the, the demon, uh, the woman that has the demon inside her head's going backwards because they're so confused by the, the standard. We need to keep these guys in command three to five years and we need, and we need to commission far less officers. And we need to not manage by yearly cohorts. And we don't need to, we need, don't need to be afraid of people that are really talented at a younger age moving ahead of someone else. That's what we've got to do. I we've think that may be more, the biggest factor because that's the, the difference more, between yeah. the private sector and the military is that the private sector will absolutely reward and, and yeah. replace. And if you are a young hotshot and you are the brightest thing anybody's seen in a long time and you come up, you're sharp and your ideas are new and they're revolutionary yeah. and you can back them up, there's going to be room for you at the table. And, and we don't do that. We, Like I said, we still promote. If you look at the promotion system today, then now there's little tweaks and little different subtle differences, but it's no different than the system we developed in 1947 to support upper route and mobilization. That is, <clears throat> we're going to... We're going to commission a lot more people than we need. We're going to get rid of them through up or out, and eventually we'll have the, the, the large population of lieutenant colonels and above we need, and particularly generals. And through the, through the decades... Not necessarily the right ones. Right, right. And, well, I mean, to get up to that system, you cannot make mistakes. You, if you're a maverick and you make a mistake in experimenting... You're done. Which is very critical in a learning organization. You have right. to experiment, then you're done. Exactly. And, you, and you need a culture of experimentation and rewarding yes. of, of taking chances. Exactly. You're exactly right. And taking chances as long as you don't make the same mistake twice. And when you do make a mistake, you can explain why you made it. Because an idiot or a stupid person cannot explain why they made that mistake. A maverick or a person that's innovator will tell you, this is what I did wrong. This is why it happened. But I will not let that happen again, and I'll do it better the next time. And here's what we've learned. Right. Yes, I'm absolutely with you on that. Now, you know, not one of the three of us here is uh, here to, you know, to bash the military. We want to help things get better. We want to help things move forward and be more effective. So what, if I can ask as, you know, on behalf of the layperson, where can I get my information? What should I be reading, Don? What should I what should I put my eyes on so I can educate myself to vote in in a way that's going to be more supportive of the things that I think are going to help our military be more effective? Well, go. I mean, 
apart from reading my books, which will, will tell you in detail the why, why we got, we didn't do these things out of evil or corruption or. or no, we, we've been, like, the military is fantastically successful. We've eliminated the, all of the former ways of doing war. You know, that's, that's it. We've done great at that. We can manage the hell out of fighting up to about the 1950 year level and anything before that. It's the stuff afterwards that we've struggled with. Well, I would I would even argue that, that that's not the case historically because of the detail I go into. I see what you're saying, but we're not even good at that. I mean, if you look at the at the record in World War II, again, we came into the fourth quarter and we still and got took a lot advantage of, stuff of some wrong. tactical mistakes. Right, well, at strategic and operational mistakes. Okay, and then even in Normandy, we were supposed to break out of there within a week. It took us two months against someone we outnumbered ten to one. Uh, that. 10 to 1 means a total of forces, logistics, air power, and everything. And they still almost beat us. Why? Because their junior leader, your, their leader development was incredible, and their unit cohesion was absolutely done correctly. That is, they maintained units together and didn't replace individuals like we do today. Okay, but that's another whole lecture. But I, if you want to read all that, read my book, uh, Path to Victory, America's Army and the Revolution and Affairs. I rewrote it in 2013, and Doug McGregor, Colonel Doug McGregor, McGregor of Breaking the Phalanx, wrote the forward to it. Now, if you want to get a lot of short articles, go to the Strauss Military Reform Project at the POGO website, the Project of Government Oversight website. Winslow Wheeler runs it. He's a great American, a big hero. Go see that website, and it will provide you a lot of evidence why we need to, to fix a lot of stuff again i'm doing this for one big reason we got great people at all levels i know some great generals now that i've talked to a lot but overall we have a system that works against evolution works against mission command works against learning and flat organization it's too bureaucratic there's too many self-serving people that put uh, stability in, in the cart before moving forward and adapting the things that make it better for the soldiers and the Marines and the airmen before we go fight the next fight. That's why I'm in this. Hey, Don, if you could say one thing to one person, here's your platform. Here's You want to change one thing. You want to call somebody out. Who's your call out, and, and what do you want to change? Can I prelude that with, with something before yeah, I Yeah, man, it's, it's your call out. You can say whatever the hell you want to say. I, I got asked by that by a very high-ranking person in August. I won't disclose him because he's a good guy. He's really high up there. But he asked me the same thing, and my answer was, and then Tom Ricks asked me that a few weeks ago. That's why I wrote the article on Tom Ricks' page about if I could change one thing, it would be the culture. Because if, you, if like, for example, if I change up or out, okay, and make it an upper stay, you have to fix a lot of other things because there's so many second and third order effects. So when I... I have that one question. I, I will say this then. I would, okay, I'll say I would, I would reduce the bloated officer corps is what I would do. And who are you going to talk to to do that? Uh, well, who has to do it is, uh, the president, the Congress and the, the president have the authority to commission people and the, and the numbers come in laws like DOTMA 1980, uh, set the, set the levels of officers and so forth, uh, and the number of generals. So it has to be a congressional act. But the senior officers of the of the military had to push for that, and I don't think so because uh, for some reason they like a bloated officer system. Okay, they say it's because of the technological advances, but it just it, it just doesn't make sense historically. I did a study in 2010 for Lieutenant General Vane, Mike Vane of Arctic, which <clears throat> he liked the study, and you guys can get it online. But it says why a bloated officer system degrades their ability to act faster and be adaptive. It's an extensive study, and I'll send it to you if you want me to. Yeah, send me an email and tell everybody what an RKIC is because no one knows what that is. Yeah, RKIC is Army Capabilities Integration Center, and I worked there after I retired. I was uh, General Barnes, Kevin Burns, the trade up commander in 05, loved my work, and when I was getting ready to, f to retire in 2005, uh, no one would hire me in the in the Beltway. But General Burns came up to me at a AUSA breakfast, the Association of the United States Army, and said, Don, what are you doing after retirement? I said, sir, I'm nothing right now. He said, would you like to work for me? And I said, yes, I would. He says, do you have something you've been working on? I said, here's my study on how to reform ROTC. And I gave him the 280-page binder. 
<clears throat> he went off and read it over the weekend and then uh, hired me to work at Arctic Ford uh, on leadership issues. And I did a bunch of studies for them on adaptability. And I did over 70 workshops to uh, various Army centers of excellence on how to do adaptability. So it worked out good. Yeah, well, it's, it sounds like, if, if nothing else, our listeners are getting that. You have no problem calling calling people out calling shots and have plenty of ideas and trying to become an innovator. The system doesn't want innovation. I agree with you there. I've, I've felt the same pain as you. I've run around for 10 years getting shot at and blowed up at the lowest levels, watch commanders from lieutenant all the way up to full colonel make decisions and help guide them towards the right decisions. That's what that's netted me is it's not a whole lot of influence once I got done doing that. I've either got to go there and, and be in danger yeah. and not make a difference or find something else to do. And it is very frustrating. And, and I, I feel your, I feel your pain there since, uh, since your frustration and I, and I get it. And what's important for our listeners is to get that this, these debates are heated. They're impassioned. People's lives are at stake. We're all trying to do a better job at it. And everybody in the military is trying to go in the right direction, but there's, there's a lot of disagreement on what's next, how to fight these fights. It's folks like you that even if, if you're, 20% wrong, man, getting halfway closer towards your side of it is probably in the right direction. You know, you may not get everything you want. I may not get everything I want, but at least you're, I got an organization that's growing and a, a well, learning organization like you talked about. Well, Pete, I feel, you know, a lot of people are listening because I was at Fort Benning last summer teaching my workshop and they had me review the programs of instruction for cadre development or John, that's teacher development. Uh, at these armor school courses, and a lot of them were using my material to teach cadre. And then I've I've been contacted over the last four years by uh, lieutenant colonels and colonels at the war colleges, Marines and Army colonels, that have done their yearly papers on my work. So it's getting out there. Good. What, frust what frustrates me is give me a position to do something about this, as I've offered some high-ranking people. Again, I won't call them out by name because they're doing the best they can. They're they're trying their best, but how they've been grown limits them. I use that term a lot. They're grown a certain way where they only know one way to do something, and as a result, they do the best they can, but it's not enough. That's why, you know, most of the people are self-serving, but they don't do it intentionally. They're, they're people that care for their families. They say they see that's the way it's worked. That's the only way it worked. If I speak out or try to fight the system, I'm going to be destroyed, so I'll just do the best I can within the system. That doesn't make them evil or wrong. Sure, there's several, there's a, a few very self-serving and mean people that are toxic leaders, but they just don't know any better. But what's wrong is they need to take a moment and open up their minds and say, we're not going to win if we're not evolutionary. Well, the tech companies would agree. They like to iterate, 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 iterate. I shoot, John, I have no more questions. Do you have anything else? I'm trying to get my arms around what I need to get my arms around for the next time we talk to you. And I'm being presumptuous, but, man, I'd really like to evolve myself and go learn some things based on this conversation and then have another one. Can we talk again when you're finished with your book and see what's in that book and get a preview of what we, the education we may get from it? You know what, John and Pete, one, I want to thank you guys for creating this form uh, and I, like, I may disagree with John Nagel, but I'm glad you had him on there to create debate. That's a great thing. Debate is a great thing. And like you said, even if 50% of it, of what comes out of it, it's still evolution. Like animals don't evolve overnight. They evolve over thousands of years. Unfortunately, we don't have that much time. Hopefully it doesn't take us that long. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I need some wings. But if you want to find out what's in the next book, I sent John a paper, which may, uh, Brigadier General, I don't know if she made Major General Peggy Combs, an outstanding general officer, the commander of Cadet Command, made all her cadre read. It's a, it's the Mission Command paper, Misinterpretation, Mission Command, uh, Can the U.S. Army Do It? I sent John the paper the other day. If you want to find out what most of my work centers around, just read that paper. Well, if we've got that, we'll definitely be reading it. You've given us a lot of homework to do. <laughs> and I would love, I love to talk to you guys in the future. I'll let you know when the books 
out and we'll do that again. You've got an open invitation whenever you want to come on and, and promote something or talk about a new idea. We need to hear from you, the people that want to understand. You know, our combat forces have left Afghanistan, and I'm going to tell you right now, people are still going to be in peril as Americans advising them. It's very confusing for the person who doesn't understand the, the mission and why we're there and how we're there. And it's for guys like us, it's frustrating as we watch the insanity that happens. So feel free, feel invited. And, and if there's other people out there in your circle that, that need to get out there, let's talk to them and figure out how to continue this debate and advance the, uh, the issues that are out there because we, we certainly can do better. We should expect ourselves to do better and give our listeners a chance to uh, figure out how they can get a hold of you. I know you, I know you've got a Twitter account. I know you've got a Facebook. And if they've got specific questions, I know that you have got answers for them. So if they want to reach out and talk to Don Vandergriff, how do they get a hold of you? How do they uh, read more about you specifically? I first of all put my name in Google, Donald Vandergriff, and it'll come up a hundred thousand times. All my articles and and access to my books are there. But if they want to email, I answer every email. I, I do it every day. It's uh, Vandergriff Donald, all one word, lowercase, at USA.net. Like I said, I'll look at me at Google, go to LinkedIn. I'm, my email's on there. And uh, feel free to call me or uh, email me. I answer every email. Yeah, Don doesn't hide. Also, uh, make sure, everybody, you read uh, you read the book, Path to Victory. Yeah, Path of Victory, America's Army and the Revolution of Human Affairs. It's 400 pages, but it will tell you the why, where we're at today. There's a good reason we're at, but we need to change. And the big book that's all over the Army, mandatory reading in a lot of places, is Raising the Bar, Creating Leaders, Creating Adaptive Leaders to Deal with the Changing Face of War. And I know you thank thanked you. us, but we got to thank you, because if we don't have the people that will debate with us, then um, there is no conversation to be had. And while we love music and talking to artists and performers, we also love talking to warriors and people that we all owe a debt to. And we all owe some time to understand better what guys like you and I have gone through so that we can do a better job with our sons and daughters. Absolutely. Thank you.